Um, thanks everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. I'm not sure who else is going to be joining us. I'm gonna send out a recording after. Leo, thank you so much for speaking. Uh, really appreciate it. I'd also like to take a quick moment to give Sean from Liquid, uh, CEO of Liquid, a shout out. Uh, he's our event sponsor. Liquid is our event sponsor this, uh, this week or this month. Um, so just a, a couple of points of order. So we're going to be moving away from the decentralized brand because we are Bitcoiners and Bitcoiners only. So we're going to move forward under the Vancouver Bitcoin brand uh, as soon as possible for the next event. Um, I have an event page that um, I'll, I'll donate to this group and uh, we'll get that going. So um, for now, for all communication, look to Vancouver Bitcoiners, so Van Bitcoiners on Twitter. And that's where all of the announcements are going to be. Um, I'd like to give Melissa a quick shout out uh, for organizing this and pulling everything together. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, we, this would not happen without you. So um, we really appreciate it. Um, also to Ryan and Adam for the live stream, although that was me this time. <laughs> so um, there's that. Yeah. Anyway, um, these things happened last minute. I know, Adam, you had a big client and presentation beforehand. So uh, that's cool. And what else? Um, one of the things while I've been down here in my undisclosed location is uh, connecting with other Bitcoiners and other groups. So some of those people might be joining. I'm not 100% certain, but I know that they've uh, graciously sent out this um, this meetup through their accounts. And uh, it's a weird delay. Interesting. Okay. So without uh, further ado, Leo, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks for hosting us. Uh, thanks for the drinks. Um, thank you for organizing, Alexandra. Thank you for organizing. Um, I'm talking about the Lightning Network today. And talking about the Lightning Network can be difficult uh, because the Lightning Network is complex. And because the Lightning Network builds up on top of something um, that is already oh. relatively complex, uh, being Bitcoin. Um, so um, in Comparison, the Lightning Network um, allows for a lot more things um, than Bitcoin does, but it still depends on Bitcoin's blockchain, Bitcoin transactions to function. Um, it also creates a couple of confusions on what really now is your Bitcoin. If you hold Bitcoin in the Lightning Network, um, we often call them Satoshi. And if we um, host, hold our Bitcoin in a Bitcoin wallet, we call them Bitcoin. Um, so now how um, is it the same currency or these different assets? We have exchanges listing them separately or together. Um, and all these things um, can kind of mess a bit with our perception of how we've learned um, to use Bitcoin over the last um, uh, 10, 12 years. Um, often when we talk about um, when, we, when we are being introduced to um, altcoins or cryptocurrencies, Sorry, or Alex, systems. can you mute? Alex? Or Chris? So I, am, I am muted. Yeah, yeah, Chris, if you can mute. Thank you. Then okay, often... I'm going to go off video as well. Uh, apparently, my video is a little bit blurry, so uh, Leo shows the uh, floor is yours. Um, so we're often um, introduced a bit to Bitcoin's limitations are often used as a, as a setup for uh, something that replaces Bitcoin and something that, um, yeah, um, something that is not Bitcoin. Um, and in this case, we take um, Bitcoin strengths and we leverage them for something that solves these kind of limitations. So we know that Bitcoin um, is slow and it's blockable, so it might be expensive, and um, definitely has very limited capacity in how many Bitcoin transactions can we really make. Um, that, that's per second, worldwide. That's per second worldwide, seven, yeah. Seven transactions yeah. per second worldwide. <laughs> and yet the Bitcoin blockchain is also like, quite well decentralized and it's quite easy to take part in the Bitcoin blockchain to download every single transaction, verify it for yourself, even on a low powered computer and to even take part in mining um, at home. Um, even with uh, even with these fascinating little USB miners, um, you're still able to take part today in a mining pool um, and get some let's get some small um, share. Um, so in my presentation today, I do want to get a little bit technical, um, partly because um, I understand 
many of you are technical, um, but also partly because I do think this is something um, that is possible to explain, um, even to people, even to those of you who do not um, think about technology 24-7, who do not work as programmers, who are not trained mathematicians. Um, the, um, the little parts of the Lightning Network um, don't often require us to understand exactly how the math works behind it, exactly what the code looks like, um, but just the principles um, uh, of how exactly is a transaction being done in the Lightning Network? What is a payment channel? Um, and how can we leverage these payment channels to form a network um, through which we're able to really pay anyone around the globe um, within a few seconds at a very, very low fee? So in Bitcoin, um, when we make a transaction, we broadcast it to the entire world. It's a bit like radio or TV used to be. When you have a TV station and you want to um, put out a radio broadcast, you really have to tell everybody. And everybody is then um, able to receive it. But throughout the airwaves, of course, we then only have limited um, space. You might remember um, there used to be only a handful of uh, TV stations and only a few more radio stations. It used to be very difficult to, to start the TV station. Um, and um, that had um, um, tremendous costs. Um, in Lightning, what we do instead is we broadcast transactions only to our peers. Um, so Lightning itself is not really a blockchain in the sense that um, every single Lightning transaction is recorded on all of our computers. Um, but instead, we use something like Unicast. So we use something um, like um, the internet, where instead of YouTube broadcasting all videos to everybody at the same time, they only broadcast the video to whoever currently requested it. And that's how we're able to make um, far, far more payments um, because every individual member of the Lightning Network only needs to keep a record of the payments they made with their peers. Um, and that is something where once we join the network, um, of course, we still have to verify all the Bitcoin transactions that ever exist out there. Um, but we're able to vastly reduce the amount of transactions we need to make on the Bitcoin network um, to be able to pay for things like coffee or um, our VPN or VPS services um, by simply, and this is where I'll then start with, with what the network actually is, um, by simply um, funneling our payments through these payment channels. Um, so this is a bit of, um, if I now may attempt um, to explain how this works um, on a technical basis, um, this is a bit of the prerequisites um, we need to know of how, how Bitcoin works. Um, if you don't know exactly the, two de the, the details of these, um, don't worry either. Um, a very brief overview, Bitcoin uses something like unspent transactions outputs. So instead of, for example, uh, a bank account, which just has a list of accounts and then a list of balances associated with those accounts, Bitcoin just has a list of transactions. That's all that means. And so in Bitcoin, what we really keep record of is these um, all the transactions that ever happen. And what your wallet then does is that looks through Bitcoin and sees how many of these transactions re um, relate to me. And then the wallet sums up your total balance. Um, so it's not an account-based system, it's really like a transaction-based system. Um, the second thing um, is something that we call a multi-signature contract. Um, it, the, those exist in Bitcoin in various forms. You can almost arbitrarily create them. And Lightning uses a very specific kind, a two of two, meaning there are two participants, both of them have a key, and every transaction <coughs> um, that is made from this address needs to be signed by both parties. One party alone cannot move the funds. If um, one party were to refuse to sign, then the transaction cannot be made at all. And the last thing um, is something like a time lock transaction. It's also um, relatively um, easy to understand, similar to how in checks, um, we might be able to define a date when this check is valid. For example, we know we're getting paid um, on the 1st of March and um, our rent is due on the 2nd. Now we can, on this check, define that the check is not valid before the, the March 1st um, to ensure that we have enough bank account, bank, money in our balance um, to, to cover this. Um, and there are uh, relative transactions and absolute transactions. Um, absolute really just means on March 1st, our check is valid. And relative means that 
three days after the money has come into the account, only after the, those time and they can be spent. So it's a bit like um, slowing down transactions in your, in your accounts. Um, and I like to use this check analogy um, because I do think that Bitcoin transactions um, somewhat resemble checks. Of course, there's a, a couple of points where this analogy breaks, but a check has a serial number, um, a check has a date when it would be issued, a check has a signature, um, a check would define um, how much money is supposed to be uh, moved, and a check defines from what account this comes from. Um, so in Bitcoin, we call the serial number the transaction ID, which is really just a hash of the entire thing, uh, just a cryptographic way of uniquely identifying this check. Um, we have, um, instead of defining what account it's coming from, right, Bitcoin doesn't have accounts, Bitcoin has transactions, <coughs> we define what transaction we're spending. Um, so if you received your um, your paycheck on March 1st, then that paycheck itself has a serial number. And if you want to spend that paycheck to pay rent, you would then say from the serial number of the paycheck um, to the public key or to the hash of the public key of um, the landlord. Uh, we can define the amount and the signature. And of course, um, the Bitcoin, um, everything's a bit more fancy and new and more powerful. Um, we can define rules, um, checks, Theoretically, have that too, uh, but in Bitcoin, we can we can create quite powerful rules um, that define exactly under what circumstances this check is valid. Now, how do we use these these checks? This is what this looks like often on a, on a block explorer, right? You have uh, an an input. Um, somebody must have sent this. Um, somebody must have sent this um, individual. Um, 2.5 million Satoshi at some point, and now they're transferring it on, um, meaning they define coming from this um, transaction. Now I spend it to the following two parties. And often two parties means you spend a little bit um, to whoever you owe money to and the rest to yourself. And then we have this included in the block. So then here it says confirmation. Um, now we can use all these concepts to create payment channels. Um, payment channels are really just Bitcoin transactions that have confirmed. Um, they, you can think of them also as a as a shared um, as a shared account um, or as a shared jar. Um, we will define how much Bitcoin will be put into that jar, um, and we will then so. Um, let's assume we both want to open a payment channel, we would first create such a jar. Creating such a jar is just a cheap um, calculation. Um, at first, it's just empty. And now, now I can say I want to put a Bitcoin into that jar. Um, and as far as the Bitcoin network is concerned, that's just a Bitcoin sitting somewhere. But as far as we are concerned, um, we want to be able to move parts of that Bitcoin, force them back between us, and just keep a record internally of who now owns how much of that Bitcoin. Um, so, and the main problem that we have, remember the two of two multi-signature, is that we want to be able to do this even if we don't know each other, even if we're anonymous on the internet, and even if we don't trust each other. I and mean, that's not just about cheating each other, that's just about trusting each other to be, for example, available. If I now put a Bitcoin into such a two of two multi-signature address, I really need to be able to um, make sure that I get that Bitcoin back, even in case the other party um, disappears. And that disappearing can mean they go offline for a while, or disappearing can mean their computer breaks. Um, the, and for this, um, we create a, a trick in which we, remember how all these transactions are chained up on each other where we start with our refund transaction. So before we put money into that jar, we make sure that we're able to refund it. Um, so we have such an opening transaction and um, in which I put a Bitcoin into that jar, a Bitcoin into our payment channel. Now, at first I will not sign this transaction because I don't want it to be valid yet. I want to make sure that if it really um, if really something goes wrong, um, if we, for example, can't complete this interaction, can't complete the creation of this payment channel, that uh, I haven't yet um, yeah, lost control of my funds. Um, but instead, we will create 
kind of like a refund transaction. Um, and this refund transaction um, allows me to, in the event um, that my channel partner, my peer goes missing, I'm able to take um, the Bitcoin out of the channel again. But we will not broadcast this because we don't want to create the jar and then destroy it at the same time. Um, but we want to create this transaction and my peer will sign it and I can verify that the signature is really correct. Um, only after, so I'm Alice, right? You're Bob, you're Bob. And um, only after I've created this refund transaction, only then do I feel safe of really putting money into that jar. And um, so only then will I sign the initial transaction and settle it on the Bitcoin blockchain. So then it has confirmations. And now our um, payment channel has been created. Um, at this point, I could, but don't have to also uh, sign it myself. And now, theoretically, even though this transaction just sits on my computer, um, it can be published anytime. Um, I go a bit into the rules about um, exactly what, uh, what other safety mechanisms there are to um, a bit later. Um, what we can now do is we can update this refund transaction. Um, so uh, at first, the Bitcoin that I put into the jar is fully mine. I have created the channel. Um, I'm not paying anyone yet, so um, I want to be able to get the refund of a full Bitcoin. But is, now, is it possible to zoom in a bit on it? It's, it's hard. To I don't do. think so. Um, no. Okay, no. That's fine. yeah, <laughs> if you're not, but I will share this. Um, I will share this with everyone. Um, it's also the details aren't too important. It, um, there's really a lot of hashes and Bitcoin addresses. What what matters is that um, at first I own the full Bitcoin in that jar, and now I want to pay Bob, um, meaning. We don't want to create a transaction and publish it to everybody for everybody to verify. We don't want to pay on-chain transaction fees for this. We can just update our balance of how much of that Bitcoin now belongs to me and how much belongs to my channel partner. Uh, and this is uh, very cheap to do. Um, all we need to do is we need to create a second refund transaction um, that supersedes the first one. So now in the second refund transaction, if any of us were to ever um, go offline or depart or decide to um, decide to not no longer want to be in the Lightning Network, um, we now have a refund that only gives me, in this case, um, 0 0.9 Bitcoin back, while 0 0.1 Bitcoin now go to my channel peer. And we can do this as often as we want. We can send um, tiny amounts of Bitcoin forth and back, um, because all we need to do is we need to just create these new refund transactions, um, invalidate the old ones, and um, keep a record of them. Um, and that's also how Lightning is then able to scale to so many transactions. Um, because with only that one on-chain transaction, um, we can now make hundreds of transactions between each other, um, pretty much only limited by our bandwidth and computing power. Um, so now we are really able to also make tiny transactions because there's, uh, at, for, at least in this case of a payment channel, um, of a one-to-one of -one -one payment channel, there's no cost associated with them anymore. Um, only once we decide to part ways, do we have to settle that final state? So imagine there's a, there's a jar that has Bitcoin on it and we keep a record of how much of that is mine, how much of that is yours. Um, and after who knows how many hundreds of transactions, we are able to make a um, kind of like a final, um, final accounting and, and we publish that transaction. That is now again, a transaction that we publish on the Bitcoin blockchain for which we again have to pay fees and for which we're again limited by all these things um, that Bitcoin uh, What triggers us. the settlement? Um, so the settlement um, can happen in uh, two different ways. Um, the cheapest type of, of settlement is if we just create a, a standard um, Bitcoin transaction signed by a two of two um, that just sends it back, that, that's something we have to do cooperatively. And then the Lightning Network, if you have a channel, you can always request your peer to close it. Okay. Um, now, if your peer is offline, um, you will have to unilaterally publish this refund transaction. Um, and there are some um, there are some interesting conditions that I'll um, so might go into a little bit later. Um, it's more of a, how do we prevent, so imagine I've, I first own the full Bitcoin and I have a refund transaction for the full Bitcoin. Um, now, once I send a portion of that to my channel peer, we create a new refund transaction. But theoretically, 
they could both still be valid. And I could attempt to cheat the other party by broadcasting my previous um, refund transaction. There are a couple of mechanisms in there that prevent this. And this is also then where some of the cryptography or some of the um, script magic gets a bit more complicated. Now we might have a bit of time to go into this, um, but um, what we need to do next is using this payment channel logic, we need to turn that into a network. So we need to be able to, because um, once again, if we had to create a payment channel with everybody that we would ever interact, um, the, Lightning network, the Lightning Network wouldn't be a network, first of all, uh, but also it still wouldn't scale uh, because you'd still need at least, first of all, you would, you would need to put capital into every um, economical relationship you have with the stores you frequent or with your employer or with your landlord. Um, but so that would bind up a lot of capital, uh, but also it's, you'd still um, need way too many of these payment channels. Um, so to turn so, this into so a network. Before I go there, I'm yeah. gonna maybe just have a different perspective because you were using the jar analogy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're like peanut gallery comments, but just to like kind of reinforce what you're trying to say. Um, so using the check analogy, so usually a check has like a, a from and a to, but Bitcoin transactions can have multiple to destinations. Yeah. So, you know, that another way of thinking of it instead of the jar is that you have uh, a check that you're keeping um, between the two of you and you're just updating the values on those, on those two outputs. Yeah. Okay. And then you only settle that check when you want to close the channel. Oh, go back to the time. Yeah. Or but whatever. you never have to like go to the bank to cash that check. You just, between the two, you're agreeing based yeah. off of cryptographic signatures that you're updating those values. But, and then when you're, got, when you're done, you want to settle on chain, then you can put that in the yeah. bank. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. So you're kind of keeping it internal on that layer above, right? Because yeah. yeah. they're just going refund, and refund, you can do that. refund. Oh, we're done here. Yeah. Boom, let's yeah. publish it. And you it can now. do trillions of transactions, right? Yeah, Without even sense. Bitcoin yeah. blockchain. No, no yeah, 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 makes sense. So that's, that's what allows it to scale to like infinite in some sense. Some pubs used to allow you to do that, right? You just go in and <laughs> update your ledger, and there'd be a ledger of all the, of all the good customers, <laughs> and you just say, I just put it on my tab. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll settle later with, who knows. Um, so now- Tab channel. Yeah. 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 Um, so now, how do we turn these payment channels into a network? Um, and theoretically, if I now create a payment channel with, with Bob, and Bob creates a payment network with Carol, then why wouldn't I be able to make a payment to Carol by using that same um, logic? So I can make these, cheap and instant payments to Bob, and Bob make a, makes a payment to Carol, um, and now we have made two payments in two separate um, payment channels. Um, we haven't really incurred a uh, cost yet, um, but how do we do this safely? How, if I don't trust my peer, if I don't trust Bob, how do we prevent Bob from just taking my money and then saying, oh, I already gave it to Carol, and Carol never gets it? Um, how do we prevent um, participants in a, in a network from, um, yeah, from cheating each other. Um, but also, how do we prevent from payments from really from failing in a in a in these weird states where they're now stuck with somebody we don't know, right? This happens in, in Swift quite a lot of times, um, and in Swift or in generally in in um, interbank payment systems, you have these correspondent banks, and banks have bank, and the correspondent banks might also have banks with accounts of central banks. And they all just clear each other out in a relatively similar way, but they have to trust each other. Um, and if you've had an international payment stuck, um, like I have, and like many of many of us probably had, um, then you can imagine like well, how confusing that can be when your bank sends the payment off to a bank in another country um, that has no insights in of where the money now is, um, and now the payment doesn't arrive, doesn't forward it for some reason. Maybe the name was spelled wrong, um, or maybe the bank account number has changed. Um, and in Lightning, we don't want that to happen. We don't want the money to ever be stuck somewhere. So we want all payments to be um, what we call atomic. We want them either to succeed in full, or we want them to fail in full. So we either want the money to never leave my account or to safely arrive on the other side. Um, and so the magic that we currently use in the Lightning Network is called the hash time-locked contract. Um, and it's hash time-locked um, because it has two conditions. Um, these contracts um, are a type of um, a type of script that we use for these Bitcoin transactions, these checks earlier, that just define um, a condition. And these conditions um, are theoretically quite 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 easy to understand. You will say, 
I will make this payment to you if either you can show me a secret or the payment will go back to me after a certain amount of time. So that's why we call them hash time locked. They're either locked by the by the by a hash. That's how we kind of define the secret. Um, or we just say the money goes back to me. Um, and that's how then I, so in, in, in practice, the recipient has a secret. Um, the recipient generates the secret. It's really just a random number. And they will not tell the secret to anyone um, other than in the form of a, of a hash. Um, and this hash kind of uniquely defines um, the secret, um, but <clears throat> without a, anyone able to find out what really that number is. Um, now, the payer can now say, whoever has that secret is able to claim those funds. Um, so now I can safely go um, to, to Bob, to my first channel peer, and uh, hand them a Bitcoin under these conditions. I can say, if you can give to me the, the, the secret, you get that Bitcoin. And Bob can take that same hash to their to their peer, um, in this case, for example, Carol, um, because they have nothing to lose in this case. Um, either the secret becomes well known, in which case they receive a Bitcoin on one side and lose a Bitcoin on the other side, um, or nothing will happen. If the secret will never get known, um, then, they're, then neither of these two channels would have to be updated. And now it's the recipient's turn to once they have been offered a Bitcoin, right? Because the final recipient is being offered the so Bob is being offered the Bitcoin under the condition of revealing a hash that Bob doesn't know. Um, but the final recipient is, is offered a Bitcoin under the condition of revealing a hash that they do know. So the final recipient has this incentive to say, yes, I want that Bitcoin. I want to get paid. I want to sell whatever it is I'm selling. So I'm revealing the secret to the peer. And then the secret will pass on through the through the entire um, network back to the payer until everybody knows the secret um, and the payment has been like, safely um, put forward. Um, we can think of the network a bit like this, right? So here are Alice, Bob, and Carol, and each of them, each line represents a, a jar. Um, so each of them have a payment channel with each other. Um, so there's really just seven participants in this network, um, and we only know the name uh, of four of them, uh, three of them. Um, but um, in this case, right, we can play a bit here with it. Um, the colors always represent kind of the how much of the jar belongs to each participant. Um, so Alice and Bob, they have a jar. They own about 50-50 of it. Uh, Bob and Carol have a jar. Carol owns most of it. And now in this case, who pays who? Yeah, Alice pays Carol. Um, no, Carol pays Alice in this case because Carol's balance goes down and Alice's balance goes up, and Bob, Bob's balance really just shifts from one side um, to another. Um, and now, why would somebody participate in this? Um, the first incentive is you want to make and receive payment, right? That's a clear incentive to participate in a network like this. Um, and um, there's a second incentive that, um, yeah, the network creators have um, kind of introduced um, specifically for individuals like Bob um, to provide connectivity in that Bob is able to charge a fee here. Um, so Bob is able to say, you give me, if you want me to pass on one Bitcoin to Carol, you have to give me 0 0.101 Bitcoin or something. Um, and these fees somewhat compensate you for putting your Bitcoin into the network. Um, and uh, that creates a couple of very fascinating dynamics um, that we sometimes don't fully understand yet. Um, so we don't quite know how can now participants really most effectively deploy their capital. Right? Lots of people are trying. Some people are doing better than others. Um, the, um, the comparison is often in, in financial system, you also provide liquidity to participants, often in the form of, of loans. Um, so for example, banks loan each other money. Um, and for, for those loans, they charge each other uh, a fee. Uh, and we can think of that in the same way as in the Lightning Network, um, with the difference that we don't really 
and most of the time pay people to provide us with funds directly, but rather we pay people for the opportunity to send us um, to send us um, funds, right? And for that, we might compensate them in various ways. Um, the Lightning Network has grown, um, yeah, quite quite impressively over the last years. I think we're up to eighty thousand channels and thirty thousand nodes, um, with about three thousand four hundred Bitcoin in the network. Um, impossible to visualize. Um, it's becoming even difficult to just visualize your part of the network. And uh, yeah, Wait, I can go after you. Uh, no, no, this is a good time. So uh, I had a question on the number of hops in your chain. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions on that. The first one is, does the complexity of the contract increase as you add in the number of hops? Or is it the same, yeah. same contract? So there isn't really a limit on the number of hops. Um, but you can imagine that for, so we have 80,000 channels now with 30,000 peers. Um, we're still at the point where a mobile phone can relatively easily just find any participant and then find a couple of channels. Because often enough, the, the, the complexity is not so much in finding channel uh, or finding a route. The complexity is in finding a route that also is able to pass on the funds, right? Yes. Um, if, if my... Actually, that was my second question. Yeah. The first one is, uh, does the smart contract get more complicated as you add um, more hops? No. The so HDLC just... is always the same. Um, so the <clears throat> HDLC is really just concerning the channel peer. Um, and so luckily for, for the Bitcoin, for the Bitcoin part of the transaction, it doesn't matter how long the how long the chain is, how long the path is. Um, but for finding an efficient route. Um, so that's a bit of a problem we have here. This is um, probably here number one, even. No, this, here there's uh, another slide with limitations. Um, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Um, the, so liquidity is an issue. So finding, so we have now millions and, and hundreds of millions of possible routes from two popular nodes to each other. Um, but we might have to try them one by one. And now how do we do that? So that's uh, like a computer optimization problem, yes. how do we, because not because it's a multi-dimensional, right? You not only need to find routes, but you also need to sort them by how expensive they are. Um, and because different nodes might, different routes might have different costs. The longer a route is, typically the more expensive it is. Um, but also some shorter routes might be very expensive. Um, some routes that are likely to succeed might be more expensive. Um, some routes that are not so well maintained might be cheaper. Um, and that's, it's a problem that works surprisingly well, but that there are still some, some, some limitations in the Lightning Network um, that um, I'll, I'll look at them in a second. And the JAR um, validity in real time, because the JAR is going up and down in real time as well. Um, the JAR, you mean the value of the JAR or the, the, the value? value of the JAR, so you want to find a route where yeah. the JAR is valid yeah. in every hop. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I want to make a comment because I feel like maybe we like skipped ahead too far, at least on the HTLC side, in the sense that um, why are we even trying? Why do we need HTLCs, right? I don't think that was like so. If you think about it, that first example when you have a, a single check that you're updating between two peers, the issue if you only had let's, let's imagine you had to open a, a bar tab or check between each peer you wanted to send money to, that would be it'd be really annoying to have to do an on-chain transaction for every single person you want to do have economic activity with. So like HTLCs solve this idea where, you know, you can update between you uh, your peer and that that peer can update between their that peer and that that peer can update between that peer all atomically, so that you don't have to connect to every single vendor to make a payment. You can actually just as long as you're you know that that you're well connected in the network, you can make a payment to anyone, even though you don't have a direct payment, uh, a direct channel to like let's say Starbucks. So I think that's maybe that was skipped over, but that's kind of what <laughs> yeah, HTLC, it's just, it's, HTLC, yeah. HTLCs are just the way of doing atomic updates across the chain of checks. Yeah, yeah we require the HTLCs to be able to create these chains, to be able to yeah. create these through the network and be able to do that safely. Um, so you already pointed out like one of the major limitations of the Lightning Network is that um, these channels still have limited liquidity. If there's only one Bitcoin in the jar, then that channel is unable to and I'm unable to pass on more than a Bitcoin through that channel. And in reality, 
after a few hundred transactions, maybe only half of the Bitcoin is owned by me and the other half is owned by the other party. Um, now, that only means that that one Bitcoin channel is only able to pass on half a Bitcoin. Um, or um, furthermore, um, the outsider, only us two really see how much on the jar belongs to who. And so an outsider might, be, might want to attempt to route like 0.3 Bitcoin through that channel, but it doesn't work because I don't currently have enough balance in that channel. And that's um, something where, um, yeah, finding these routes is, is complicated, not just because we have so many of them, but also because some of these routes are not going to work. And um, they're going to fail either because the peers are offline and they don't respond quickly enough, um, or maybe specifically because there's uh, liquidity issues inside of them. Um, the, another big limitation is that we do have some kind of interactivity here. Um, I think for for future commerce, that's not so much an issue, and there are actually quite some cool ways to at least like fix that in a hacky way. Uh, but if the recipient needs to create that secret and pass the hash on to the payer so the payer can create these um, HTLCs, that means they both need to be online at the same time. Um, they can't. It's not as easy as with a Bitcoin address where you can just pass that to somebody and you're off to some tropical island and turn off your internet for a week. And when you come back, your Bitcoin or in that address secure and, and uh, people have been able to make payments to it. But rather, you need to keep a server somewhere. You need to be online or at the very least, you need to have your, your phone turned on right? um, as you receive. Um, and we are still ultimately limited by what we can do on Bitcoin. Um, although now, if we want to our four to seven channel openings per second, um, that of course represents a lot more potential economic activity than if we have four to seven uh, transactions every second. Um, I think the benefits um, are quite are quite huge, and we're starting to see see that in um, yeah, really being able to cheaply buy things online. Um, I think something that's often overlooked is that these payments are instant. Um, which is quite important for a lot of situations. Uh, maybe in maybe if we buy something um, on an online store, um, a Bitcoin transaction does as well because we can wait for the confirmation, we can do other things. Um, but even when we buy things online, we might want to get that confirmation immediately. Um, and um, even today, Bitcoin is probably most commonly used for um, yeah, speculation and gambling, uh, but even then it's quite valuable to be able to settle in real time. Um, if you want to make a deposit to a casino or to an online exchange, you really don't want to, to wait forever. Um, and um, that's something that the Lightning Network is able to um, achieve. Um, and that's something that the Lightning Network might even be able to, um, yeah, kind of justify at even larger costs, right? So you might be even, especially for large payments in Lightning, um, it might depend, there's always a, so in Lightning people often charge the percentage of your, um, of the amount they forward, um, which means that small tr payments are incredibly cheap. Um, you're able to make instantly a thousand Satoshi payment, um, but very large payments can quickly get expensive if you get charged I think a typical fee would be 0.1%. Um, so for a 1 million Satoshi payment, um, you pay a thousand Satoshi in fees, and that's probably more than you would currently pay on chain. Um, the um, privacy benefits um, are maybe a topic for another talk, for another talk. Um, that's quite a complicated uh, topic because we haven't really figured it out yet how much information so we, we leave very different information on the lightning network about ourselves than we do on bitcoin and, and to some degree um we have something um like sender privacy and recipient privacy and we're currently in the lightning network if you want to receive lightning payments um it is currently very difficult for you to hide who you are um because it, you, you always leave some kind of trace of, of where your node is or at least even just knowing that five different payments were all made to the same node, um, then that's already uh, reveals quite a lot. But sender privacy is uh, is incredibly well developed already in that if you make a payment to an online store, they have no way of finding out where that payment is coming from. Um, while for you as a payer, it's quite easy for you to, to know where that payment is going to. 
Um, and that creates fascinating dynamics, right? Because for an exchange to allow payment of with lightning withdrawals is legally a very uh, easy thing to do um, because they, they have a very easy time of just finding out, is this really your lightning wallet? Um, and then we safely make that transaction to that. But as soon as you then spend the money, uh, unlike, for example, the on-chain, um, the, 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 the exchange will have no knowledge of when or how or to who you spent the funds that you just withdrew. Um, and in the opposite direction, it can get very uncomfortable for the exchange because they have no way of really telling where the money is coming from that you just deposited into the exchange. Um, so those are lots of fascinating um, questions. Um, I think this, um, um, I just want to leave it here quickly. Maybe it is all up to our imagination of how really we want to use it. Um, over the last months, I've been um, quite fascinated about um, an idea called LSAT, which is a lightning um, authentication token, lightning service authentication token. And it's a bit of a, of a fancy way to create tickets, um, to create um, cookies that are only valid if a payment has been made. Um, so the idea is kind of to create a a machine to machine payable um, internet where instead of having to sign up for an account and having to, yeah, you are just able to make a quick, uh, pretty much just a get request. You're being sent back a cookie. You pay the lightning invoice associated with that cookie. And now the cookie proves that you have paid um, your for your service. And as Lots of fancy tricks to be able to do that, like metered API calls where you just say, I'm going to buy 10,000 um, get requests, or I want to buy 10 gigabytes of data and, and, and all these things. Um, I think that alone will quite change the way um, the, in, the internet services and web services function. Um, currently, it's still quite difficult to establish all these relationships and, and we tend and that tends to kind of create monopolies, right? Everybody has their Amazon account, their AWS account. So we go to AWS for everything. Um, but maybe in the future, if we have an kind of what we do for information, right? Well, we have just HTTP, an easy way to, to request information from everyone. Maybe in the future, we'll have um, an easy way to just make and request payments um, to and from everyone. Um, I um, so I will share this slide, and you're able to to write me any time with questions. Um, I do write about um, the Lightning Network for a living now, which I'm very proud of. Um, so if you uh, I so I do uh, I should explain it, um, and if I don't, then um, my fault. And I need to get better at it. Um, these are free satoshis. So if you do have a Lightning Network, this is a very little sum. But maybe even a little sum is more um, is more powerful in demonstrating really what the what the network is able to do. So if you have a Lightning um, wallet, just do each other a favor and only scan it once. Um, <laughs> I think there's there's enough in there for everyone. Um, this could also be a good opportunity to just. Is that it? It says press to claim Bitcoin. Um, does that? That's the. Is that the? No, you should. <laughs> I mean, that's the URL associated with it. Um, but you should be able to. Does it work for someone? Well, this one doesn't work. OK. What do you think? What do you think? Bitcoin 50 cent. Yeah. Trust yeah. to claim Bitcoin? Yeah, got it. Yeah. yeah, OK, great. Yeah, interesting uh, wallet. I don't know what wallet you used. I'm curious. Um, the. Breeze should have worked. Yeah. Blue work. Um, so this is a bit another bit of a trick. Um, it's called the Lightning Network URL, uh, in meaning this is really just a little token, a little secret that your wallet presents to my server, um, asking what is this. And the server says back, "Oh, this is a thousand satoshis. Um, would you like them?" And then your wallet can say, "Yes, I want it. Redeem." And then your wallet will issue the invoice, send it to the server. The server will then pay that invoice to your wallet, and hopefully it succeeds. The um, so there's a lot of interaction there going on, and it's just kind of abstracted into into a single um, into a single fetch thirty two encoded URL. Um, 
if you want to try sending, there's also lots of different fancy things. So um, luckily, luckily, the drinks are sponsored, so you don't need to pay for them. Um, yeah. But as a demonstration, um, there are also lots of different ways that people try to figure out how can they make the Lightning Network really usable? How can they make it so that all our economic interactions, right? When we buy something, sell something, win something, um, that it's a, a very uh, smooth and uh, satisfying process. So this is something called a Lightning address, which all, hasn't existed for very long. Uh, it looks like an email address, and theoretically, every email address could also be a Lightning address and vice versa. Um, but works very similar as to the QR code before. The in the same way that an email address tells your server where to look for to send emails, um, this Lightning address just tells your wallet where to look for for instructions on how to send money. So uh, you can then, use your email for your Lightning you could, address? Yeah, ideally, cool. ideally you, you could claim it on ESAP. Ideally, you'd be able to receive yeah. <laughs> information and money instantly through the same identifier that you use online. Yeah. Um, and this is just the same thing, just encoded slightly differently. And this is a, something completely different. This is a, um, a point of sale device um, some that you can use in an online store. Um, so I'm quite excited of how um, the Lightning Network is really able to, yeah, inspire new forms of um, new forms of human interactions. I'm very optimistic about how the Lightning Network is able to help people from all around the globe to kind of, in the same way that the internet has really helped us communicate cheaply and, and for anyone around the world to collect information. Um, the Lightning Network is going to be able to enable these exact same people to then also participate on the internet economically, uh, meaning sell and buy services. Um, and if we just think about how transformative the internet has been um, through being able to just collect information, now what if these people can all become producers and consumers online as well. Sure. Can you just explain, those are, I realize now those are three different things. Can yeah. you explain each, each one of them? So this is just a link to a web store okay. um, from where you can then kind of have a digital shopping cart, right? You can say, I want to buy this, two of this, three of this. Um, theoretically, you would be able to um, enter an address maybe if it's, a, if it's for shipping, kind of like Shopify. Um, where you can then pay with a Lightning invoice. Um, the, and they all run on the same server, actually. Um, this one is called the Lightning URLs, similar to before. It's really just an encoded URL. Mm -hmm. And your wallet decodes this URL, pings it, and just asks the server, what is this? And the server will reply back, oh, it's a donation point. You can, um, you can donate as much as you want here. But this could also be a QR code in a vending machine. So the vending machine says, here's a can of Coke, and underneath is a QR code. When your wallet scans it, the server would be able to reply back, this is a can of Coke. It costs 2,000 Satoshi. Would you like to buy it? And then you would be able to say and pay. In this case, if you say pay, it's kind of boring. You probably just, maybe you, maybe, if I configured it right, you just get a quick message back saying thank you. Um, but um, the, you, your successful payment could trigger the vending machine to spit out the can. Um, there are lots of ideas on how to make this more complicated or how to merge these. Why not just scan a kind of, nowadays, if you go to a restaurant, you're being presented with a QR code. Um, why wouldn't that menu also allow you to immediately order the items and pay for them? Um, so that could look similarly too. Um, that could also be, again, a withdrawal. So you can imagine that your interaction with a with a slot machine um, could be quite could be quite simple and, and smooth, right? You arrive at the slot machine, maybe you, you place your first your first bet, and to push the handle, you need to make your payment. So that's a scan of a QR code. Um, so either you pay per per round or you deposit a fixed sum of money, and to then withdraw your winnings, why not just scan a QR code again and walk away, right? Yeah. Um, so if you do have any more questions, then feel free to ask or ask each other. There's lots of experts here. Um, 
I have one question yes. about the settlement. So mm -hmm. once uh, in the Lightning uh, Network, you're going and doing all the transactions and you finally settle, how long does it take once, once you've said, hey, we're settled, for to go into the block, like the Bitcoin blockchain, is it? Um, so in the Lightning <laughs> transaction, we would consider the Lightning transaction settled. The second these uh, channel balances have been updated. Um, so I do consider a lightning transaction to be finally settled. Um, so theoretically, there isn't really a need to, to close that channel ever. Um, but, um, but like in Bitcoin, like th th that actual, when it has to settle with that, like that lower layer. Um, so it doesn't have to. Um, oh. So the channels have, they have a, an infinite lifetime. You can keep them for as long as you want. Um, most of the time, you would probably close these channels if either the peer is offline or you no longer want to participate in the Lightning Network. Maybe you close down your store, um, or maybe you have accumulated a certain amount of, uh, of Bitcoin in that channel that you want to put away. That's closely, what I'm getting right? at. So um, you, you actually have a choice of at what point when to like permanently store it over yeah, there. Yeah. Oh. And again, um, there are different yeah. different uh, uh, lots of different tools people use okay. because sometimes your channels are they provide you with the ability to receive payments okay. so sometimes you might not want to close that channel no, um, I get it. I you get might it. want to push it for a, this is again um, a fascinating topic a submarine swap how can we safely exchange like bitcoin on the lightning network and bitcoin on the bitcoin network um, without counterparty risk um, for example, for the purpose of emptying out a channel and putting Bitcoin into cold storage, because so those it's are kind of like savings. cold storage. The other one is more considered cold storage. Um, I think that's a great use case yeah, for, like for Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I like that yeah, term. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I think what, one yeah. thing important to note is that there's actually two um, ways to close a channel. So you mentioned this briefly, which was you have the cooperative case where you both are online. Yeah, when, yeah. Okay. So that's just a regular Bitcoin transaction. Remember, you're updating a Bitcoin transaction like yeah. a check back and forth. So yeah. you can just broadcast that. You both agree. You both sign and you broadcast it and finalize it. Okay. But if that if your counterparty is, out, is offline, then it's the um, the the unilateral case, which is and it's and that is a different um, output. So it's a different script. It's a different locking script for that case. They, they do that for a specific reason, I think for um, game theory reasons, but uh, it basically you can't actually get access to that Bitcoin for quite a while, it's time long. But it, it's kind of like in the Lightning Network, you can kind of keep going back and forth, exchanging, buying things, this, that, and the other, but you don't necessarily have to cold storage to the yeah. uh, finalized yeah. uh, Bitcoin store, if ever. No, like I've, just keep yeah. I've, had, I've had Bitcoin transactions like since 2018, but I've never even settled them, they're just okay. they're offline. Yeah. Oh, wow. so probably the best reason why you want to ever close a channel is because you want to reallocate your capital. Maybe you open a channel to a okay. to a store, or, or if like if your counterparty is offline all the time. I kind of, yeah, I see. So it's, yeah. I kind of think it's like you have a bank account, not you know the old school like bank account, and then you have if you wanted to cold storage, you, you buy gold, and then you store it somewhere at home. Yeah. right? like I'm using that term yeah. loosely, but yeah. okay. Um, so maybe it's something like so. so a compass card, right? Yeah, could be seen as a bit of a payment channel where you yeah. make a single transaction into your compass card, and now you're able to cheaply transact with yeah, it's with kind the of like you train, fill the, yeah, right? you fill the compass card and then you use it. But yeah, yeah, but and compass, then compass cards are limited in the sense you can only use it for that one application. But yeah. you know, having these generic payment channels, you can and they're networked. So yeah, you can, you can kind of like interact with any vendor. So you can yeah, you vendors can just plug into it, right? and, and you so it might be connected graph wise to that vendor. You don't have to have direct. So the, okay. the analogy with the compass card would then be to close the channel would be to return the card and you get your deposit back. Yeah. But you might not want to do that. You might want to find somebody who exchanges your balance in the card with cash because you want to put the cash away and under the mattress. <laughs> and uh, you want to keep the card for future transactions. So in the medium of exchange is the Satoshi. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it gets more interesting. Like, or even thousands of the Satoshi. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm just saying that's the medium of exchange that you use with them. But that's really just Bitcoin, right? Like a hundred million Satoshi or Bitcoin. So one thing, one interesting thing to point out, which is I don't think it was mentioned. So if you think about a regular transaction, like with a Visa card, you know, it's not actually final, so it can always can be charged back. Yeah. So with these channels, they're actually just valid Bitcoin transactions that you're updating in real time with cryptography. 
Yeah. So every lightning payment is a final transaction, like in a way that it can't be charged back. So this is actually a huge benefit to a lot of vendors. You know, you once the lightning transaction confirms, it's a it's final. Like it's not, you can't get charged back. So it's a huge thing for businesses. Yeah, I think that's a big deal. Instant settlement. Yeah. And in and, and, and final, not just instant. Yeah. Right? I have a question that's a far technical, part opinion. Uh, why is it that uh, state channels got popular with Bitcoin, but side chains were popular with some other blockchains? And why did state channels make it here, but somewhere else it was um, uh, it was side chains? State chain, state chain, state state channels or like payment channels? Yes. Really so these, yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm taking this as a state um, channel. But what I mean is, so, uh, Bitcoin got a state channel that got popular, and Ethereum got a side chain that made it big. And yeah. the state channel did not make it big. Um, Bitcoin has a pretty popular sidechain called Liquid. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and there, are the, there are other, like, yeah. Like Bootstock could also be considered a sidechain. Um, but yeah, I think um, if you think of Bitcoin and what it's for, then it's relatively boring and simplistic, right? It's just trying to be money. It's just trying to be money that you save up or that you pay each other or that you, um, that you use for, for commerce. Um, while a lot of other, like, cryptocurrency platforms um, or blockchain platforms are trying to be very different things. They're trying to be settlement net platform, settlement layers for contracts, for example, for all different kinds of tokens and NFTs. Um, and so if you don't have an homogenous, um, if you don't have an homogenous token or use case, um, then you might also not have a homogenous um, network. Um, so I think that somewhat explains to why in Ethereum you have like dozens of these side chains, for example, and everybody's trying to interoperate with each other um, because there isn't so much like a um, a single thing that everybody wants to do, right? Not everybody, it, people don't use Ethereum primarily to send each other either. Um, so then, so then, even though there have been attempts to build a second layer for Ethereum transactions, that's not what people immediately need or want. Because um, Ethereum is not trying to make money, it's trying to be a lot of other things. And I think going back to what you originally said about broadcasting um, these, okay. so th there's a SparkNotes version why like almost every single blockchain in the world is a scam. Um, and the very simple uh, answer to that, which is imagine if you, if you like any individual person on the internet who they're just watching a YouTube video, they had to broadcast all those packets to every single other person on the internet. <laughs> it's the most inefficient system. And this is what we built these like blockchain technologies off this idea where we're just going to unicast, broadcast every transaction that will ever exist to every single computer in the world. It's just the most yeah. inefficient way yeah. to build a ledger. So, layer two technology like this is the only reasonable way to scale um, to like to the whole world. So every other blockchain is like, oh, we're faster, we have more transactions per second. If they're just a blockchain, they're not going to be able to do what they need to do. It's just, they're, they're just trying to scam people. So. <laughs> they don't scam. It's great presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Leo. I'm back. Um, so before, I, what I wanted to do is do a quick lightning round, but before that, I wanted to give Sean the opportunity to come up and say a few words about Liquid. Uh, so Sean, if you're still there and you'd like to say something, please come up. I'm happy to sponsor the event. I'm Sean, I'm the CEO of Liquid. Yeah. The LKW. Thank Strong. you for sponsoring. Yeah, I know there's only two bottles of wine. No, there's a lot of money. Yeah, we're trying not to oversell it. Bitcoin was down this week, so I'd be like, damn, it's gone. I can't buy as I'm much. Do it. You know, I, we, we'd be happy to sponsor these events until the end of the year, so. No um, problem. And uh, we certainly have our own office. There, there's, there's more beer use. and uh, other drinks. Uh, feel free to help Thank you for allowing us to use the office. Yeah. Thank you so much. So no. we're, uh, we're a Lightning Network service provider. We have a, a platform as a service to allow uh, companies to get on the Lightning Network very easily with an API. And we're, we're targeting uh, exchanges and wallets like netcoins.ca is one of our clients. Of course, that's a company that we're heavily connected to, but nonetheless, that kind of scale. And we're trying to make it so that. Uh, those kind of companies have um, everything that they need to get onto the Lightning Network. Our primary objective is to provide liquidity, and we have routing nodes set up in all kinds of countries around the world. We're rolling out about 23 to 24 nodes around spots around the world. We've announced it publicly, um, and we, like I said, we are the world's first publicly traded company entirely focused on Lightning Network. And our our job is to bring as much capital from the capital markets to the Lightning Network 
and provide as much liquidity to the system. And uh, liquidity is really what the Lightning Network is all about right now. And I think really, when I look at Lightning Network, we'll look at it as um, it's the it's the iPhone moment for Bitcoin. It's the it's the killer app, uh, and nothing else can be killed. It's the Lightning Network itself, and the trigger will be when it takes off when channel rebalancing and liquidity on the network is seamless uh, is when it's going to really start to just be extremely accelerate. And I see that happening over the next 18 months as, the, as there's progress made in the industry. So by great software teams developing other mechanisms and technologies around it, then companies like ours just bringing brute force and lots of money and encouraging other public companies just to come in and pour lots of uh, Bitcoin into the network and flood it with liquidity, uh, which will ultimately, uh, I think, uh, over time, uh, soak up a lot of supply of Bitcoin as it gets locked on the channels or, or placed on the channels. <laughs> I know it's locked on the channels. <laughs> okay, so one thing I have to say with the Ethereum, that the whole stake thing is much better for the common person to understand right now. We don't have that marketing. Anymore. It's locked. <laughs> I got it. Right? I got to explain it to shareholders. They're like, oh, it's kind of like Ethereum staking. I'm not going to use that word. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. Um, at any rate, that's what we do, and we're, we're really happy to be part of the community, and We've been engaged in a lot of things, and for that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, I'm Adam. I started at Aptech. We've been doing ledger based stuff for a long time. I know some of you from the last time you visited here, the first event. Uh, but uh, we are proud of using ledger before Bitcoin became a thing. So, <laughs> made a business out of it, and we build. Um, everything on Ledger, and it's actually, it's actually better to build regular applications that way, and uh, we're living proof of it. So if you want to learn about how to apply how all these ledgers work uh, for Bitcoin, et cetera, and apply it for everyday applications for your uh, experts uh, locally and globally, so feel free to come by for other events here that are focused on more mundane applications and boring applications that still take advantage of this incredible approach of of being accountable for how information changes, not just currency changes, but we apply uh, accounting principles to systems automation. So thanks for coming and- uh, Where do you share these events? events? Uh, here, um, yeah, we, no, we where use- do you, like, How can we uh, keep up to date? Usually meet up, uh, but uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to decentralize ourselves from some <laughs> of the lockdown platforms. Um, I'm a huge open source proponent and I really don't want to be locked in into anything. So, Yes, there is a meetup.com uh, right now, but uh, we'll be announcing another ones. And uh, generally, we keep them every Thursday night. Um, uh, with COVID, obviously, we had to put that on hiatus for a couple of years, but things are rolling around again. And uh, it's really nice to see um, people locally that are trying to push the envelope in, in ways to better automate systems, better ways to program, better ways to keep data and be accountable. Uh, we're all about that. So uh, anything event-driven or ledger-driven, uh, we definitely have presenters on those uh, different platforms, different projects, open source or otherwise. So I welcome you in here every week if you want to come by. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody okay. else? Sorry, Alex, stealing your thunder. <laughs> <laughs> you can try. Okay. <laughs> here we go. I can just hit a button. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, um, go ahead. I'm quiet now. <laughs> um, yeah. So if, if no one else has anything they want to say, um, so what we're basically going to do is every third Thursday, we're going to have a, what I'd like to do is have a couple of speakers, um, probably for 30 to 40 minutes each. Um, we can do everything from technical talks. I'd like to touch on privacy as well. So if anyone wants to speak on that going forward. Um, and as well, um, one of the things that some of the groups down here do is they'll blur out faces. So um, I, I really appreciate when people are, are taking photos if they, uh, you know, if they, if they take that into consideration. Because um, Bitcoin is, uh, as it gets more and more expensive, um, I mean, it's a small attack vector, but just privacy is something that should be uh, should be by default. So if anyone is at the event and does not want to take their uh, have their photos taken, um, please let us know and we'll we will make sure that that's accommodated. Um, and then other than that, uh, there is a telegram group 
and uh, Bitcoiners only. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just uh, you can reach out to a couple of people there. Uh, they can get you added. And once again, I'd like to thank Leo. Uh, Leo, you gave an amazing presentation. Really appreciate your time. Um, you are a Lightning Labs gem. I know that they think very highly of you. So thanks. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. And thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, um, I'm going to end the live stream and uh, head out, but um, I'll be posting this recording probably in about a week. We want to make sure that uh, it's edited properly, and uh, we'll put it out on the Vancouver Bitcoiners channel. So I know not everyone was able to join the live stream, and, and some people were, were very interested in what we're doing. So we'll be doing that, and stay tuned for next month's event. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye. So we have uh, still a lot of beer and wine and all that. We're going <laughs> to spend another 